1 Corinthians 15, next to the last chapter in uh, this big book that carries so much weight, the 15th chapter is uh, very important. The last chapter is more just taking care of nuts and bolts, uh, administrative things for Paul. The 15th chapter underscores everything he has said up until now, and it is a great, many of you know the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians to be the resurrection chapter, the focus on the risen Christ, and uh, as we read earlier with the boys and girls, on the gospel. So we're talking about uh, upgrades during uh, this series, and what does it look like to take a next step, to, to upgrade your spiritual life, and this is Upgrading to the Christ-centered, gospel-centered kind of life. So each of our lives is centered on something, right? What's the center of your life? I'm not talking about your, well, it's God, family, and whatever your third thing is. Not that kind of listing. What informs everything? I mean, everything flows out of something, and that's that center of your life what's the really the main thing in your life the only thing not just first priority but what dictates all priority what's on your list and what are you most passionate about what do you love talking about we push your buttons just a little bit and you start talking about something what uh when your mind just drops into neutral what's the first thing that pops in that you want to start processing thinking on thinking about or what is it that defines you? Like, this is my identity. My identity, what defines me is my, my career. What defines me is my resume of accomplishment. What defines me is my family. What defines me, that, that thing at the middle of me is some ministry, some cause, some movement, some political affiliation. Maybe it's a hobby, a talent. Maybe it's your stuff. It's your possessions, your house, your car. It's something that, this is me. Could be any number of good things, but when it comes to centering our life, God's word says there's only one thing that should be most important. And that takes us to the first verse, of the 15th chapter of the first letter in the Bible to folks in Corinth. Now, Paul writes, I, I want to make clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you've taken your stand, and by which... You're being saved if you hold fast to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the, all the apostles. And last of all, as one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim and so you have believed. The most important thing. Some of your translations say, as of first importance. The Bible tells us there's a lot of different callings and a lot of different possible ways you can serve God in the world. But one transcendent truth should define our lives. One simple truth should motivate our work. One simple truth should affect every part of who we are. Christ, the sinless Son of God, died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And that gospel good news is something we just ought to be passionate about. And it ought to be about more than just that story. What is the gospel by the way, today we're going to do several circles. This is really a one-point sermon. We're just going to keep circling back on it. You just finished the first circle. Here's the second one. What does it mean to live a gospel-centered life? What's the gospel? Well, the gospel literally means good news. And that word, God, the translated gospel, shows up 93 times in the Bible. All of them are in the New Testament. 
Uh, it's based on a Greek word, euangelion. Euangelion means, uh, well, and you hear a little of it in the, in the Greek word even, evangelist, evangelical, flow out of that kind of word. Good news is the simple translation of the word. Broadly speaking, it is, it's the whole of Scripture. It's a story of God bringing redemption to a broken world. That's the good news gospel. Narrowly speaking, the gospel is the good news of Jesus who made a way for us to be saved, to be rescued, to be redeemed, to have a relationship to God, to have forgive, sin forgiven, eternal life in heaven. Uh, that's the gospel. Okay, so living a gospel-centered life is living, well, this is a big, deep thought, so you better hang, hang on to the back of your pew for this one, okay? To live a gospel-centered life means living a life where the gospel is, you guys are bringing the A game today, where the gospel is central. Yeah, that's what it means. So here's what that means. Any kind of situation arises, you say, how does the gospel speak to this? And the gospel saves, but the gospel also guides, empowers. Uh, so if you're confronted by sin and temptation, put the gospel up and say, what does the gospel say about this? How does the gospel change how I'm going to respond to this temptation to sin? Parenting can be so complicated. And I look out here and I see some of you Parenting's complicated because it's a preschooler, and some of you, parenting's complicated because your baby is my age. And parenting is complicated everywhere in between. So how does the gospel inform what you do as a parent at all those different stages of parenting? How does it guide, how do you, how do you decide what's important and what is not as a parent based on what the gospel says? The primary reality of the Christian life is Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised from the dead. And everything else is going to flow out of that gospel. And every question gets answered in reference to what Jesus did at the cross. One theologian said, the gospel-centered life is a life where a Christian experiences a growing personal reliance on the gospel that protects him from depending on his own religious performance. Because we do a lot of pretending, relying on well, I'm going to try to be a good person. I'm going to try to be a religious guy. I'm going to check the boxes of uh, what it means to be a good Christian. And, oh, it's going to come up so far short. It's going to frustrate us. Or being seduced, overwhelmed by idols, which means there's always something else competing for our, for our, our attentions, for our affections, for our commitments. And idols are anything that steals away from God being everything. Now, In my experience, the gospel-centered Christian, and when I'm always wrestling and always trying to lean and always trying to grow in this area, is just the Christian that's looking, always looking to the gospel as the power to bring about any change, any growth step, any uh, Christ-likeness that they'd seek to develop in character or in obedience. The gospel is the reference point. And no matter the situation, how does the gospel apply to this? At work, at home, wherever you are all the time, how does the gospel apply? Now, this is a big theological sweep of a sermon. What does it mean to live a gospel-centered life? It means that everything we do, everything we think, everything we say is radically transformed by the grace of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, was buried, was raised from the dead. And in light of the gospel, we say, you know what, I'm going to lay down my efforts to try to, try to measure up before God, and I'm going to accept his gracious, unconditional love, demonstrated so completely, purely, forever, eternally, at the cross and the resurrection. 1 Corinthians now notice, first Paul says, I received the gospel, and then I passed it on. Gospel means good news. I'm amazed at how many people say, I received the gospel, and I just hugged it real good and hung on to it tight. But that was the end of the flow. 
Paul says, man, that's not how you do this. I received it, and I, I couldn't help but pass on good news. I love passing on good news. Sometimes I think we love passing on bad news, the gossip of bad news, much more than we enjoy the, the good news of the gospel. Second, the gospel is of first importance, and it just means, he's describing, everywhere these early followers of Jesus went, these apostles went, they preached They preached about a lot of stuff. They talked about how you live together and how you live in a pagan world. They hit those those marks too, but ultimately they preached Christ and Him crucified. And that was at the center of everything they talked about. That was the driver. They knew that was the life changer. That was the, the thing that made a difference for eternity. And they never backed off of that message. And third, the message of the gospel is accompanied by proofs. Christ died for our sins. And our substitute, our, uh, our atoning sacrifice. Christ died for our sins, and uh, that's proved by his burial. He rose again, proved by all those eyewitnesses that Paul lists here. Fourth thing is that all this was done according to the Scriptures, and the theme of the whole Bible, salvation, men and women, through Jesus Christ and him alone. The Bible is the story of the gospel. And it's, it's the word of God. Paul says uh, in, to the Romans, first part of Romans, it's one of my favorite verses. There, there are a lot of verses. I had uh, about a dozen here that I could have read, but I just want to do this one. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, do you want to be ashamed of the gospel? Well, if you're not receiving it and sharing it, you're ashamed of it. There's a pretty easy math problem that is... That, Uh, communicated there I'm not ashamed of the gospel it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes why would I want to keep that to myself I'm not ashamed of it I'm not afraid of what somebody's going to say about me or how I'll be criticized or people won't like me anymore because I told them the way to eternal life he said everyone who believes Jews, Greeks, doesn't make a difference who you are where you came from, where you've been this is effective for everybody so here's biblical Christianity. And, uh, and, I, and those of you who are new to our church may not have heard that phrase before. I use it regularly, biblical Christianity, because there are a lot of expressions of Christianity that talk about Jesus, but it's not this one. It's, a, it's an imaginary Jesus. Biblical Christianity, and again, many people name the name of Christ, but it's not a biblical a biblical message. It's a made-up Jesus. It's a made-up religion. It's a made-up faith. A made-up way to go to heaven. They just came up with something that made sense to them because it didn't get in their business too much, I guess. Biblical Christianity just crashes headlong into cultural Christianity. And that's just, uh, that's just pretty awesome. Because cultural Christianity is what we're used to. Cultural Christianity says, well, I live in the United States and you ought to go to church sometimes. And so I go to church sometimes when it works in and kind of do my social obligation. Uh, it's kind of like uh, I mow my yard so my neighbors don't get after me and I go to church. So, you know, I guess I can keep in good shape with God. That's the cultural Christianity. No relationship to God. Just, just the cultural thing that you do. Biblical Christianity crashes into cultural Christianity. Biblical Christianity, you know what it says? Live for Jesus. Biblical Christianity says, deny yourself. It's not all about you. Biblical Christianity says, take up your cross. You have to die to some things. Things that uh, other people seem to be really celebrating. And follow me, Jesus says. You have to follow Jesus. Jesus' will, Jesus' ways, Jesus' purpose. Cultural Christianity says, you deserve to be happy. Cultural Christianity says, God wants you to fulfill your dreams. And it's all about you. And you are central to the theology rather than God being central to the theology. So how in the world do you remove the indoctrination of a culture that is way cultural Christianity how do you keep from being poisoned by it or just diluted by it in your commitments? And the antidote is biblical Christianity. The Bible is reliable, trustworthy, authoritative. When you start making stuff up about what life should look like or the Christian life should look like, 
instead of what the book says, you've drifted into dangerous territory. God has not said fix yourselves, and we do a lot of that too. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. God hasn't left us on our own. He's given us his word to guide us. As a, as a follower of Christ, he's given us his spirit to empower us, to lead us, to help us, right, for, right to divide the word, and then to obey, because I can't without him. He wants to transform us into the likeness of his son. Okay, so when we think about being gospel-centered people, we need to remember this. The gospel is not a point in time. It's a way of living life. And that's a little different than uh, a lot of people, uh, how a lot of people view this thing called the gospel. It's not just a point in time, a set of theological ideas like the gospel. In 1970, I realized I was a sinner and I was lost. And I had a sense of desperation about it, a real fear that if I died, I would go to hell for eternity because the Bible said that's what would happen. And that, that drove me to to Jesus, where some faithful folks, my family and faithful folks of my church shared with me the story of Jesus who died to pay for my sins so I could be set free from that kind of burden and that kind of fear. And I surrendered my life to him and I've been seeking to follow him ever since, but I've seen him working in my life in so many different ways. There was a point in time in 1970 when that happened. But the gospel is not just for that. Where, okay, lost people need the gospel. And saved people just need to work at it really hard. The go- it's the gospel all the way through. It's the good news of Jesus all the way through. Uh, he, t- he takes the broken pieces of us. The gospel is good news because he's still working on me. Because he's still taking the, the things that need restoring and redeeming and, and to make me more like Christ. The gospel is still working. It's not a point in time. It is your whole life. It's common in church. Again, gospel is just for lost people. Now I'm going to work hard and try hard and do my best. This gospel of grace is, is forever. In the book of Galatians, Galatians is great for this because uh, they said, okay, they had that idea. I got saved because what Jesus did, it's all by grace. Now I'm going to live by works. It's all going to be about me from here. I'll pick it up from here, God. I'll take the ball and run with it from here. All good. Paul says, you you saved by grace. You stay saved by grace. You live by grace. It's all about grace and this good news of the gospel. And that doesn't change here, 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 here. The main thing in the Christian life I think we're, we're, where we're tripping up so much and where we struggle is we have not thought out the deep implications of the gospel. We've not appropriated the gospel to all the parts of our life. And then and I'll give you an example from the Corinthians. So here are these faithful missionaries. They go and they go to the strategic city of Corinth and they share this good news of Jesus, the gospel. Jesus died on the cross in our place to take punishment for our sin. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. By grace, through faith in him, we can be saved. We can walk with Jesus all of our life as the gospel continues to grow us. We can know we're going to heaven one day. You have all of that going. Well, they introduced this to the Corinthians. And then the Corinthians, by the way, so have you ever heard that phrase? Man, I see this in blogs and here, here, here and there. Man, we just got to get back to that first century church. We got to be like the first century church. Which one? Corinth? These guys were a train wreck. First century church was a mess, just like church is messy today because it's full of people. And so uh, here's what happens. They get saved, and then they start doing it on their own, making their own decisions. Here's what happens as time passed. Divisions. Well, that shows up immediately in Paul's letter in uh, 1 Corinthians. All kinds of problems. They're fighting each other. They have their factions. This one's for this. This one's for this. They're all divided up into little pieces instead of unified around the cross of Christ. Immorality is just, eh, yeah, whatever. Lawsuits are suing each other. Adultery, divorce, abuse of spiritual gifts, and just being mean to each other. And that's what happens when the gospel stops at a salvation experience and the gospel isn't your life. The gospel-centered life. 
Uh, another problem with the Corinthian church, we have plenty of this today, is false teaching creeps in. As you read on in first, this, this chapter that wraps around the resurrection so very much, there are people who are denying Jesus was raised from the dead. I can point out a dozen different theological seminaries around the country today of different uh, Christian origins who deny the resurrection. They say it never happened. They deny the miraculous just in general. They say it's all about what's here, what's now. There's nothing that is supernatural about a relationship to God. It's the weirdest position ever, but they will, they will hold it. Here, they're denying the resurrection. You deny the resurrection, Jesus is just a guy. He's just a good teacher. And it's all about you. It's not about the one who died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. And the beauty and the glory of the gospel is stolen away. So one of the things that happens is sometimes there's false teaching and sometimes it's just carelessness. We're just forgetful about what Jesus has done. Many of you, like me, you, you made a commitment to Christ a long time ago. The one who died on the cross to pay for my sins, was buried, was raised from the dead. You made that commitment a long time ago and somewhere along the way, it's like, well, I think I got this thing figured out. Got all my wheels under me. I have my prayer time and my quiet time and I do this and I do that. I have a structure and, and we're kind of uh, suffering from a gospel forgetfulness. We don't have a desperation uh, of love for the one who loved us this much, it becomes uh, casual in our relationship to our Savior, and we needed saving. Like all things that are important, this gospel needs to be revisited a lot more probably than we usually do. We, again, I'm saved, now I'm over here. And I don't need to worry about that. We, I, I need my heart to be warmed by this gospel. It's one of the reasons why we sing a lot of songs about that. Because I need to be reminded over and over again of what Jesus has done for me and how desperately I needed it. I'm right on time. Number one. Now we're to the sermon. Remind yourself of the centrality of the gospel. And this is what we need in the midst of this kind of forgetfulness. The gospel good news is what Paul brought to them and he preached it to them and they received it. And he said, now it's the gospel on which you stand, which means you're standing before God is based upon this gospel. Not based on how many good things you've done, how religious you are. It's based on what Jesus did for you. This is where you stand before God, this gospel of grace. By this gospel... He says, you are being saved. If, oh man, and then he lays down a couple of big conditions. And I want you to hear this. And I'm not going to delve deep because this is a big, deep discussion. If, you're being saved if you hold fast to the word. Hold to means you are obedient to it. The mark of a relationship to God that I truly belong to God is the direction of your life. And this gospel-centered living is just a part of who you are. And you are seeing all these things and all this stuff that God says, you ought to be leaning into this. This is how you live this life. This is what Jesus was like. This is what Jesus taught. That's what you ought to be doing. Is that the direction of your life? And are you holding fast to it? Or are you just making it up from here? Like, well, uh, pray to prayer, raise my hand in a revival meeting in a youth camp, got baptized by somebody somewhere. I'm all good. Got my fire insurance, not worried about anything else. But this story, and this is not the only place this shows up, is the fruitfulness of your life is the evidence of your relationship. Is there a fruitfulness that's out there? Is there something that you have obviously laid hold of? And if not, go back and revisit the gospel. There were members of the church in Corinth that he says, you guys need to examine what you're assuming has happened. You need to really dig into this thing. Don't you think that just because you did some religious stuff, but it hasn't touched your life, hasn't changed anything about you, the direction of your life has not been altered at all, don't, don't think that this is just settled. And then he spells it out more. Unless you believed in vain, comes on down. The word vain means without consideration. 
Uh, James, in his little book, he warns about this. You say you got faith, but there's nothing flowing out of it. There's no obedience. There's no change of your life. You don't, it's, the obedience doesn't keep you saved. It doesn't make you saved, but it shows you're saved. And if that evidence isn't there, you need to go back. You may have believed in vain. One guy commenting on uh, James said, If people profess to believe the gospel but have not given due consideration to what that implies and what it demands, they, they do not really trust Christ. Their belief is groundless and empty. They lack a saving faith. To the apostle, the gospel was of first importance because it's the message that saved him, and it's the message God commanded him to share and to preach, to teach, and the gospel has to be central in our faith or we have missed the mark. The second thing to, in this gospel forgetfulness that we get into remind yourself of the content of the gospel the gospel is not a just a religious word that everyone I hear it thrown around by all kinds of people out, again out in the things I read and the things I hear in my, uh, my pastor world and they define gospel and man we shared the gospel tell me about it well we took some orphans and bounced them on our knee boy it was the gospel Man, that, we, we fed some hungry people. It was the gospel. You know what? We got to care about orphans. We got to feed hungry people. But if you don't tell them about Jesus, they go, to, they go to hell feeling loved by somebody somewhere and with a full belly, but they're still going to hell. We got to get to the gospel. Do you see the difference in that? Do you see how focused this is? There are eternal things at stake. Remind yourself of what the gospel is, the content of the gospel. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Don't hit the person in front of you and stick your hand out. Audience participation. I appreciate you pretending to go along with me. Five words. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised. Okay, now with some enthusiasm, do it with me. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised. You guys are pretty awesome. I'm glad the kids carried the ball there. All right. That's a simple, simple way to talk about the simple, simple gospel. The gospel, simple is the nine words we use then. Man, it does fill a lot of theological journals, a lot of theological books too. It's a big sweeping story. Jesus died on the cross, atoning sacrifice for our sins, miraculously, gloriously raised from the dead. That's a good story to remember. The repetition also of according to the scriptures just demonstrates Paul saying, I'm, just not, I'm not making this up. Uh, this, is, this is, it's predicted, it's affirmed, it's declared, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ the central event in all of earth history. If any of these three pieces is removed, death, burial, resurrection, there's a piece of this story that collapses. Remind yourself of the confirmation of the gospel. This from 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. And he just mentions, and these are some of the witnesses. He doesn't name them all. And some of them are big groups of people. Cephas, he gave witness to the resurrection. He talked Visited with the resurrected Christ, Cephas, Peter, the 12, more than 500 believers at one time. One of the big things about the resurrection, they charged, well, they were so grief-stricken over the loss of their beloved religious leader, they, some of them hallucinated and believed they'd seen him alive. But 500 people don't hallucinate all at the same time in the same direction. 500 at one time. James, all the apostles, and Paul says, like somebody who was just born too late, Jesus appeared to me too. Uh, it's the most confirmed miracle in history. Remind yourself the truth of this, of this story. Remind yourself of the call of the gospel. And what I mean when I say remind yourself of the call of the gospel is keep in mind two aspects of the gospel call. I had a conviction, sin, righteousness, judgment, all those things that come from the Holy Spirit. I was convicted about my need for a Savior. I was lost, separated from God, and I needed a Savior. And the call of God came to me. And I'm a new creation in Christ because I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, repenting of my sin, putting all my faith in Him. But I also have a call to tell that story. Because 2 Corinthians 5 says, not only am I a new creation in Christ, but in the same, uh, same thought, 
I'm an ambassador for Christ. I am called to make this good news known because it's such good news. Why would I want to keep it to myself? So this calling drives us forward. Now, Paul says, I am the least of the apostles. And man, Paul, he did all this stuff. Paul, you're, you're actually, you know, the rest of those guys kind of mailed it in in some ways. I think you were knocking it out of the park. You were rocking and rolling with this whole thing. Why would you say you're the least of the apostles? And here's where it comes in, this gospel story. Paul's saying, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I realize just how lost I was and how far I still have to go. And he wasn't despairing, but he was saying, God's not done with me yet, though. And and the gospel is still growing my life. This good news of Jesus is still transforming me into the likeness of Christ. God has not turned me loose, turned me away. But I know me and I know my heart. And the closer I get to Jesus, the more radiant his brilliance and the more I see still the darkness that's in me that needs to be turned over to him, to repent it of, that I need to surrender to him. We're, con- we're saved by grace. We're continually empowered by that grace to be transformed to the image of Christ. You know, salvation is more than intellectual assent to factual content of the gospel. Yeah, we're, yeah, Jesus died, Jesus buried, Jesus raised from the dead. It's a surrender of our life to him, a submission to God's diagnosis that I am lost and I need saving. It's a lot like the humble woman in Luke 7. You remember her story? She's broken over her sinfulness. There's no pride in her. There's no uh, keeping up appearances with her. She comes in Jesus at this dinner party with this Pharisee, a religious dude. And she comes in, expensive perfume. She pours it over Jesus' feet. She's wiping her feet with her hair. It's, it's the most humiliating, degrading kind of thing in so many ways. And the Pharisee, we find, he's thinking, well, if Jesus was any kind of prophet, any kind of religious guy, he'd know she is a sinful person. He's mad, at, he's, he's embarrassed for Jesus that this is going on. He's mad at the woman, angry with her for doing this at his dinner party. Jesus, on the other hand, he's not embarrassed and he's not angry at all. And he says to this religious guy, you know, um, she's been forgiven much. And she knows it. And because she knows she's been forgiven much, she loves much. Those who don't think they needed a lot of forgiveness, well, they don't sometimes don't love as much either. They think they can manage it with or without maybe a Savior. I think I can get there without you, Jesus. I think I'm good enough, respectable enough. I'm not so lost as she is. You know, we like to point it. We pick out the worst person that we've ever heard of and say, I'm better than them. At least I'm better than them. And uh, when when you put yourself up to the light of Jesus Christ, uh, there's a perspective that that, that ought to change about how you see your own sin and your desperate, desperate need for a Savior. What's the condition of your soul memory, your gospel amnesia today? Remind yourself, without Christ, lost, hopeless, broken, and not just for the salvation event when you surrender, but to every day of growing with him. You need the gospel. The gospel tells us we are saved by grace. We stay saved by grace. We live by grace. And all that in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about in several circles there of the gospel-centered life. And I'm challenging me and I'm challenging us to step it up and say, I need an upgrade. I need to upgrade the gospel and what it means and how it lived out in my life.